if that's largely made up of small cultivators, uh, the resources that would be required to make sure that we can adequately um, have a good compliance and enforcement program um, as part of our larger <coughs> consumer protection program. Um, I think once we kind of get a better ballpark on the market size and, and of what we're expecting, um, you know, Kerry can take that even more into consideration when he's looking to get us uh, recommendations from a resource perspective, but it's certainly part of the conversation. Great. Yeah, I just want to, I like the staffing up of that uh, to me seems like, you know, it could be another kind of another big hurdle that we have to overcome. And, you know, as long as everyone's on the same page and we all recognize those, I think it's it's tough because, you know, he's not in the market structure subcommittee, so which is kind of, you know, the compliance yeah, and enforcement sure. is the other side of that. Yeah. One of the other, you know, questions that I've posed to that subcommittee is, I think I said this last week um, at our Friday kind of wrap up overview of the week. You know, right now the hemp, the hemp program tries to do random inspections of 20% of their license holders. Is that and I asked this subcommittee from an adult use perspective, understanding we have lab testing and, and hopefully a culture of compliance, what's what's a good number from from that perspective to aim for? And again, that just that lends itself to your point on making sure we have an adequate um, you know, compliance team and making sure that we have the resources that we need um, to do this effectively. Yeah. Great. Anything else on this on these two subcommittees? Any direction for Kyle that we need? No. Okay. Um, I will say. I will say. We just just. Um, sorry. Friday morning after a long week, trying to just remember everything. Uh, one of the other things we did discuss in the sustainability subcommittee is Act 250 jurisdiction. Um, it's something the board's aware of and wants to make sure that we have a good understanding of because this is technically a commercial product what triggers there would be for um, growers at various different tiering or sizing of a of an operation so um, we've done a lot of outreach to other agency partners to kind of get an understanding and and we'll ho we're hopeful that, that the board can um, to the best that we're able to with act 250 jurisdiction anticipate um, where triggers might happen Julie, uh, just um, do you mind, and I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but it, I think it does intersect with our work next week on compliance and enforcement, just thinking about the municipal survey that you did. Do you want to give just a really brief update on, on where things stand with that and what you did? Sure. So I sent out a, a municipal survey with questions that went from you know, do, do you intend to put this on your ballot in, at the next time, town meeting day? Have you already voted on it? And then what types of, um, you know, uh, resources that municipalities think they'll need in order to um, to license and and um, have establishments in their town. Um, we have almost 50 respondents out of the 246 incorporated towns that we sent it to. Um, I'm hoping to get a few more before the survey closes on Saturday. Um, and then the next step in that process is to um, pull together a group of respondents for a roundtable. And I'm hoping that some of the early work that happens on um, Monday of next week in market structure, I think in particular, is going to talk about some uh, local issues, will sort of inform that roundtable and give us something to present to that group of people and provide some sort of feedback on to just kind of get a sense of where municipalities are at and what their concerns are. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. And, and Bouncing off of that, you know, in the compliance or compliance and enforcement committee, local local or model ordinances and fees is is a part of that committee as well. Our, our subcommittee member um, with that expertise had family emergencies and was able to unable to join us next or last, this this week, but next week, um, at least from a model ordinance perspective, that should be on our radar as a subcommittee. Um, we've asked NACB to to help comb through various other model ordinances in Dillon states around the country with a with a cannabis marketplace for for that subcommittee to have as kind of a a starting point. Yeah. So. yeah. 
Great. Well, um, if there's nothing else on those two, um, Julie, would you mind giving us an update on the social equity subcommittee and then the public health subcommittee? Sure. Um, if it's okay, I'll talk about public health first. Um, sure. A lot um, uh, presented in this particular subcommittee this week, they reviewed standard symbols and warnings from other states um, and some samples for Vermont, one that was developed with ISO standards in mind. Next week, they'll look at those on products, um, like sample products, to see so that the, the committee can conceptualize what those might look like and whether or not they stand out. They'll talk about the placement on the product, how large this, the font is and the type of font um, and that type of thing next week. So I think they're pretty close to making some decisions um, to send back to us in that regard. Um, they also talked about um, kind of connecting to the sustainability, the packaging issue that you brought up in the last meeting, Kyle, actually came up in public comment as well. Um, so the, the subcommittee moderators made a note of that to discuss ongoing um, in the future. So that's the um, and they also reviewed some um, some of the language that's used in other states for warnings and information that's given out at POS systems. And then also um, talked about doing a one pager for um, establishments so that they understand what the marketing and advertising requirements are and have some sort of flyer that they can look at that's easy to understand. Um, they talked so, about it in terms of a roadmap. So He froze up a little sorry, bit. What? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry about that. Sorry. Um, do you feel like do you feel like as a board member who's sitting in on those that that that, that the advisory committee members have sufficient you know evidence and and the information they need to make an informed decision or recommendation? For public health, absolutely, I think they do. Yeah, they're looking at a variety of different samples. They're looking at, at language from other states. Um, yes. Great. Um, and then for social equity, there is a lot of progress in this group as well. So they continue to review um, the language that was proposed in H414 um, as sort of the base for uh, social equity applicant definition. They reviewed incarceration rates and traffic stop rates. Um, they discussed the impact and harm of cannabis prohibition. Um, and then <clears throat> ultimately began to draft, um, NACB anyway, began to draft uh, a, a definition for social equity applicant that includes uh, living in an opportunity zone as defined by the census, uh, someone who is black, indigenous, or a person of color, uh, impacted by cannabis prohibition, meaning they themselves were impacted or a family member. And there was some discussion, I think, still to be had about what qualifies as a family member. There was discussion about uh, relationships and then in loco parentis kind of relationships as well. Um, and then they talked about uh, lived in Vermont for one year as one of the one of the qualifications. Um, and they also began a discussion about what types of, of documentation would be required as part of a social equity application. Um, and I think there's more to be discussed with that. Uh, I think there's some thought that some documentation might be available that just simply might not. So for folks who are have been in the foster care system, for example, they may or may not have access to very accurate documentation. And that's not a fault of the Department of Children and Families. They work with the information that they're given, right? So. Um, I think there's more discussion to be had on that. Their next steps, um, in, in addition to sort of finalizing that, that draft language for uh, social equity applicant is to consider the, the fee initiatives and how to use the business development fund. So those are the next things that they're gonna be discussing. So um, on those kind of criteria, it sounds to me like those are either or, um, or you know, those, it's a list of criteria. Are, are, are you thinking about them being kind of weighted differently or is that part of the conversation? So I think just getting those points down was the last conversation. I unfortunately don't have the slide from yesterday, so I, I'm not clear on whether or not those are and or ors, and that's something I'll need to, to ask. Do you have, do In you the slide, it was an or conjunction. Okay. So I, I'm sure that that could be up for discussion, but it yeah. wasn't or conjunction on the okay. slide. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would like to just hear um, that committee discuss uh, whether 
um, certain criteria should be weighted more heavily than other, um, you know, and, and what that should look like. I, I just, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I don't know what other states are doing, but that, that is something um, I'd be curious to hear as we're kind of reviewing them and determining. But then again, you know, if we have unlimited licensure, I don't know if that's the case, just to be clear, but uh, it might not matter if uh, they're weighted differently. Um, right. I'd be happy to bring that up. Yeah, I agree. And is there any discussion, has there been, of a kind of social equity cooperative model? At the very end. Like a producer um, cooperative? Yeah, at the very end of the meeting, Gina touched on that, but not enough for me to report back on it at this point. Um, I think okay. that's going to come up in a future conversation. Yeah, I believe delivery came up too. Courier yeah. model. License types. License types. For specific, like, um, allowing certain groups of folks early access to licensing types came up at the very end. This particular meeting was really focused on the definition. Yeah, it was exciting to see some a definition on on paper. It was very Re exciting to recognizing see. that that yeah. it, that might be not be its final form, but um, right. yeah, it was. I sat in on that committee. And it was it was great. Yeah, that that is very helpful to have something to dig into. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd just be curious to see how things move, progress in that. Um, of course, you know, as we have heard as a board over and over again, you know, access to land, access to capital are the biggest barriers for everyone um, and mostly the folks that have been disproportionately impacted by prohibition. And so, you know, the the delivery license type to me seems a, like an obvious path, um, low barriers to entry there. Um, the cannabis cooperative, social equity co cooperative seems like a possibility. Um, I know Massachusetts has a cooperative license type, um, but I don't think they've actually started any cooperatives yet. I think that's they they they, they have the ability and they have some applicants, but they haven't issued one. So, um, you know, maybe you can direct uh, Gina to that model or or talk to Jen Jen Flanagan about it. Absolutely. All right. Anything else on uh, social equity? No. Um, all right. I'll give an update on the market structure. Um, I'll start with market structure and pause, and then I can move to medicinal. Um, and so, market structure has met twice since our, our last Friday meeting. Um, on Monday, uh, we really dug into the um, the rough estimates for the total demand. Um, and that demand is is made up of kind of our in-state, our Vermont resident demand, our bordering state, the people that would kind of travel to Vermont to purchase from from kind of our neighboring states, um, and then just tourist demand, the people that are coming here um, for other reasons that might purchase here. Um, and essentially, uh, the the demand was there kind of a rough back then napkin uh, poundage was calculated during that meeting based upon the kind of 350 to 400 square feet of canopy and it translated essentially into a little bit more than um, 55,000 pounds of cannabis annual. Um, we did when that calculation was made during our public comment got some concerns from members of the public um, that this actually underestimated the demand um, and that also, um, that 400,000 square feet of canopy would actually produce um, in excess of 55,000 pounds. Um, but um, we really, that on that Monday meeting, dug into uh, with our consultants and the subcommittee um, the questions that are specific to um, the cultivator licenses. Um, and that really is, should we be setting tiers based on square feet of canopy or should we be doing plant count or some sort of hybrid of both um, whether we should allow cultivators to apply for any tier of cultivation um, or whether you have to start with a smaller tier and then graduate to larger tiers um, and whether um, we should have a provisional license um and this would be kind of we as a board would grant a cultivator a provisional or some sort of conditional license based upon basic information like a business plan um 
And then once we've granted that, that would enable a cultivator to go out and secure a location, start getting their local permits in order, their statewide permits in order, um, get their finances set up. Um, and then they could then come back to return to the board with a kind of full uh, application and we could convert their provisional license into a full license and they would pay the kind of fee. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of the subcommittee, I think all of them thought that this was a good idea. Um, they saw the benefits at least. It really helps test um, what's being referred to, of course, is the entrepreneurial demand. You know, if we really want to rely on small and craft cultivators, um, are there going to be enough of them out there to uh, meet this kind of 400,000 target of uh, canopy? Um, and um, it also would allow us to kind of um, get get some of the stuff that takes a little bit longer on our end, the, re the review of applications, the background checks, you know, we could get all that stuff in order. Um, so it would be kind of a staggering of some of the more administrative processes around approval of licenses. Um, and of course it benefits small cultivators that, you know, might, or small and craft cultivators that m might, um, you know, not want to start paying rent at a location, for instance, uh, if they're not sure that they're actually going to qualify for a license. So uh, it might kind of help set, you know, get get people kind of the, the assurances that they need that, um, you know, that, that they will inevitably get a license um, if uh, they can get their kind of ducks in a row, essentially. So I think there was, I don't know if there was a specific vote. I'd have to go back and check the minutes on whether or not to make this recommendation, but I think I saw at least, you know, the three subcommittee members interested in this. Um, uh, on Thursday, um, I think that was it on Monday, but I could be wrong. But um, on Thursday, uh, the, it, the kind of moderators looked at some of the other types of licenses. The, retailers, the product manufacturers, laboratory, wholesaler, and integrated. Um, and they were, um, based on some of the public comments they've been receiving, um, they tried to, they're trying to get creative with some of the tiering of those. Um, they didn't spe speak about specific, you know, canopy sizes or plant counts for kind of, you know, the, the ones above small cultivator, but they did think about how, or they did think about how we could get creative with re our tiering of retail licenses, um, for instance, you know, they, you know, obviously, I think when most people think about retail, they think about a brick and mortar store um, that's uh, exclusive to cannabis. Um, we see kind of in Massachusetts and Colorado, but um, you know, they they were thinking, you know, we might want to also consider a different tier of, for instance, a nursery license that sells seeds and clones. Um, they talked about potentially having a limited location retailer, and this is really kind of you have a broader store, like a general store, and it has a section within that store um, that, you know, would be kind of shielded from view of kind of youth. Um, it would be a separate por portion of a general store that could um, retail um, cannabis and cannabis products. Um, they talked about a, a direct-to-consumer um, you know, kind of the craft cultivator, small cultivator, direct to consumer sales, um, potentially a farmer's market sale. Um, and then uh, they talked also about non storefront delivery, um, either the kind of courier service um, or there's a lot of different models on delivery. But, um, you know, they thought that this could be potentially shoehorned into a kind of creative uh, retail license, um, a specific retail license. And of course, um, I think a few members uh, brought up that this has an intersection with social equity as well. Um, and then they also talked that there could be a tier of retail licensing that would be for um, special events, like a temporary sales permit um, for special events. Uh, with respect to these retail um, ideas, these tiers, uh, there was it was a mixed bag, honestly, from our um, from our subcommittee members. Um, I think that, you know, until you have these kind of enforcement and compliance issues worked out, um, you know, a lot of our subcommittee members have 
experience in the alcohol industry and alcohol regulations. And there are a lot to think about when you have kind of direct consumer sales or special event permits. Um, and so while I don't think that they actually took a formal vote on any of these issues, I think they did want to um, kind of hear more about what the security and the uh, compliance and, and testing and, and enforcement committees are going to come back with before they wanted to really dig into whether or not we should have these. But that being said, um, we're required uh, as a board to make recommendations on, um, at the very least, delivery and special event. And so, and I think direct to consumer, I can't quite remember. So I kind of directed them to whether, you know, let's put the compliance and enforcement aside, what would this look like and what should the fee structure be for these things? Um, because I think, you know, unless our recommendation out of the gate is just, no, don't do this. I think we need to, it's incumbent upon us to kind of, you know, phase out for the legislature what this could look like and what the fees uh, might be for them. Um, anyone, should we pause there for a sec? Any questions? Yeah, I, I think, I think that all sounds great. I'm glad that, um, <clears throat> folks are getting creative from a, from a retail licensing tier perspective and trying to take, you know, what Vermont values and how Vermont functions and trying to come up with license types that kind of reflect that, especially for some more rural areas and rural participants in this marketplace. Um, I should I should mention, um, and sorry I didn't when I was um, overviewing the Compliance and Enforcement Committee, we had talked about elevating security as a priority because I heard that from the, the Market Structure Committee. I think I have, I don't know if farm gate sales or direct to consumer is, is statutorily, you know, we have to give a, a, a statutory recommendation on it um but i'm interested in it for sure but i want to see what you know the compliance and enforcement subcommittee would say about security and how that could be handled um you know with with consumer protection in mind um uh, but um overall it sounds great i have a question about the um limited location license or limited um <clears throat> That wouldn't just be limited in terms of the amount that's sold, but it would also be potentially what's sold, right? So it could be limited like topical products only versus consumable products. Is that right? Is that that concept? I think that's right. I don't, I, you know, I, I think the, 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 the concern that came in is whether if we have this license type, um, you know, whether whether this should be a subcategory of a retailer license. Um, I think the concern that we heard was that why would anyone have a, the more traditional storefront, the brick and mortar, if this was available? And I think that, you know, part of what the consultants are trying to do is ensure that there is um, economic viability to all of our license types. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that they were thinking that there would be some sort of limited capacity um, on the storage and, and sales uh, if there was going to be this kind of limited license um, retail um, option. But uh, I think that this was really just, they've heard a lot of folks, and I don't know from who, um, but they've heard a lot of people in their outreach, I think we have too as well, that you know, we it's not going to be viable um, for a lot of people to kind of upfront the cost of putting a uh brick and mortar store you know in every town uh so we got to get creative here um and this is one way to kind of reduce the the upfront costs but um i don't know if they really dug into the to your question julie i guess when i'm thinking about it i i think about the traditional brick and mortar cannabis only stores tend to have a lot of product knowledge and the people yeah. in those stores tend to have a lot of product knowledge. So maybe on the compliance and enforcement side, if there is a limited capacity in a general store, for example, how do we then also communicate that same level of product knowledge to somebody who's maybe purchasing for the first time? It's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, again, and another intersection between the multiple committees. And, and so that's why you know I think it's going to be helpful for us to really tie all this together when we have our recommendations with the full advisory committee and, and amongst ourselves. Um, so uh, there was um, 
they they also discussed having tiers of licenses for the product manufacturer. Um, you know, the three that they talked about is having one product manufacturer that does solvent-based extraction, um, which you know has potentially a more uh, costly slash public public safety impacts. Um, one a, a separate product manufacturer that doesn't have that that might be a, a, a kind of less expensive tier. Um, and then one um, specific to small cultivators that would be somewhat limited for like pre-rolls, they said. Um, but um, I guess one of the big takeaways, and this is through no fault of our consultants because we haven't really fully fleshed out our own kind of operating expenses, but there's no recommendation at this time around what this basic fee structure is gonna look like. Um, and I think that there's gonna have to be on that a menu of options for us because um, it really depends on a lot of other collateral or corollary um, issues to be tied into it. Um, so any any questions on that before I move to medical? Um, I have a question on the production side. Is there any discussion about like cottage level licenses in that structure that you were just talking about? Something that people can do on a limited basis, perhaps out of their homes? On the product manufacturing side? Um, I all I heard was the kind of small cultivator uh, license um, that would be really uh, somewhat limited. I think that you know we could get creative there with that. So, any direction for this committee that you want to hear, or do you want them just to keep chugging along? I like I like how you phrase things earlier. I know that that committee wants to hear more about compliance enforcement, security, some of the, maybe even some of the issues that Julie just raised, but to just go ahead and try and make a recommendation recognized from a license type fee perspective, um, and just, you know, making sure that we have that box checked while we decide if, if it's something that can work in practicality from a security perspective, I think is a, a smart approach. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'll yeah. I, this is where, of course, we need to like try and tie these two committees together. And there, there's not a ton of overlap on you know amongst the subcommittee members on this. But um, yeah, I think our consultants can do the work of kind of like bridging these two committees and the work they're doing. Um, on the medical side, I think um, this committee seems to be somewhat wrapping up. I mean, they've uh, they've talked um, a lot about um, purchase caps. I think currently it's two ounces within a 30 day window. Um, I think that, you know, there's some division about essentially, listen, in, in the adult rec side, I don't think we would have that purchase cap. Um, maybe we would, but I think, uh, you know, that's kind of a, a low purchase cap, especially when you're talking about people's medicine. Um, and so increasing that, you know, I think there was a kind of a question about whether you set it at a kind of 90 day supply, whether you set it, just increase it to like three ounces or whether you tie it to the rec market. You know, my advice to them or it was kind of tie it to the rec market, but also think about what's legal and illegal to possess on your person at any one time because i don't want any patients to have to be detained and try and prove that they're a medical patient um just because they have you know three ounces or four ounces of cannabis on their person at, at a given time so i i just um to me i i suggested you should either set it to whatever we do for um the adult use or set it to what the kind of the two ounce limit, um, the personal possession limit. Um, and again, that personal possession limit does not include what you have stored at your house in a, in a you know locked container. It's really just what you have on your person or in your vehicle. Um, so, um, you know, anyway, we'll see what they come back with. I, th I think they landed on, um, I know Meg um, Delia wanted to tie it to the, the adult use rec program. Um, whatever we decide there. And I think um, Jim Romanoff, uh, the medical for symptom relief oversight, wanted to do um, increase it to three ounces. But anyway, um, 
they talked uh, about increasing plant counts for um, for patients and caregivers. Um, I think they landed on six mature, um, twelve immature. Um, they talked about um, eliminating the three month relationship uh, that you need to have with your healthcare provider um, before that person can kind of qualify you for the program. Um, they talked about uh, expanding the qualifying conditions to whatever a physician feels like is appropriate. Um, that to me has a little bit of a complication just in the way that the program is set up because right now um, physicians aren't actually recommending cannabis. They are attesting that you have one of the qualifying conditions. So, you know, if you have PTSD, um, that's a call. They are verifying that you have PTSD or they're verifying that you have terminal cancer. So they're not actually, if you change it to whatever a doctor thinks is okay, um, they're actually putting a doctor in a position that they're not currently in. Um, but I think there's certainly ways around that. But anyway, that's the kind of the, the conversation there. Um, there's a lot of discussion around this around reciprocity with um, other states so if you have a medical card in Maine can you, currently you're not allowed to come to Vermont and purchase um, and there's a question about the ha patients having to designate a dispensary and to me I thought these are kind of easy questions just allow reciprocity it kind of it, um, the dispensaries have, have plant counts um, product and so from a supply side there might be concerns around reciprocity and not having designated dispensaries but I think once we have an adult use system that um, I think those probably can go by the wayside well, but um, so there is a lot of caregivers, and so caregiver is somewhat of an umbrella term in the uh, medical world, and it means it's 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 people who can be designated growers, can kind of go to the dispensary on a patient's behalf and purchase and administer, and so when we say uh, so, a lot of discussion was involved with the do we expand the patient to caregiver ratio which is currently set at one to one and the two advisory committee members said absolutely expand it for the administering and purchasing of um purchasing the administering and purchasing the kind of like caregiving aspect um but don't expand it for the um growing um the designated growing so um, I know that we've had very strong recommendations um, from some of the other folks in the medical world about expanding that designated grower. Um, you know, my thinking on this is I actually don't have a problem with that, um, but I, I really do think that we start to run into potential quality um, control issues uh, if you had, you know, say a one to five ratio for the designated grower, you know, at what point do we need some sort of third party testing? Um, you know, because currently what it is, I think there's 400 or give or take caregivers and the vast, vast majority of them are nuclear family members um, or very close friends. You know, there's a there's a relationship there. Um, but if you, when you start to kind of attenuate that relationship, uh, do we as a board need to start thinking about quality control measures um, for the patients, um, for the benefit of the patients? So um, anyway, there was, I, I don't know if they came up with a final recommendation on either of those issues, but I do think that, um, that whatever they decide we need to really kind of like dig into all of those issues and then you know for me I just um, I don't think the elephant in the room for me on this it, which has not been fully kind of confronted is that uh, when you have kind of a profit motive and you have a huge market for adult use and you have a very limited 
market for these with some very specialized products that are prohibited um, in the adult use world that are expensive to create. Um, uh, are the patients going to get the kind of attention that they deserve? Um, and so that to me, what is the, it, it essentially comes down to what's the long-term viability of the medical program. And of course, the easy thing to do would be allow patients um, to just purchase tax-free at the adult use markets, but that doesn't that doesn't really address the concern that if someone needs um, a specialized product that's prohibited in the adult use market, um, how they're going to get the, how they get that product. Um, so I think that's the question that I need answered um, and I think about mo most often um, with this subcommittee. But um, you know, I think they did have a lot of work on the, kind of the specific recommendations that they needed to make. Um, so anyway, that's that's where that committee's at. I think um, from what I understood, they might have kind of some final recommendations for the board or for the full advisory committee relatively soon. And, um, and maybe they can just turn to that secondary question. Any thoughts on that one? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I caught all of what you said, so I apologize. There, you cut in and out a little bit, but um, on the caregiver piece, I, I am concerned about the the subcommittee's conversation there. I think one to one is not necessarily realistic, and you know, if if you're caring for um, one parent and then the other parent, especially if we're expanding the qualifications and the conditions that are allowed, it, it's possible that one person might have two parents or two people in their family uh, in that nuclear family that you were talking about um, that are providing for or growing. I hear the concern about at a certain point, there needs to be some sort of testing and quality control, um, but I think one-to-one -one is, is, is not realistic, and I'd like to hear the subcommittee talk about that more. Okay. I, I agree with I agree with Julie. I think if we again I agree with you too, um, Mr. Chairperson. If we go too high on plan count, what does that mean from a from a quality or excuse me from a from a patient count? What does that mean um, from a quality control perspective? And and maybe that's a conversation we have down the road. But um, I would like to see the subcommittee consider um, the public comments that we hear from caregivers and growers and um, dig in a little bit more into uh, what's the real concern about raising that or elevating that patient count? Because it's something that I'm interested in. Great. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you on that. Um, just because I'm cutting in and out, I feel like, uh, Julie, would you mind managing the public comment period? Yep. Um, I have one other thing on the medical as well. Um, I think among employers, yeah. what types of employing employment protections are available to people who, who have medical cannabis cards is confusing. And if there's a recommendation from the subcommittee on that as it relates to, um, you know, reasonable accommodations or, or anything like that, I think that would be helpful if, if we're able to provide guidance to employers. Did we lose him altogether? Yeah, I know. Did we lose you, Pepper? Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> why don't we move on to the next uh, the next item on our agenda then, which is comment from the executive director and the general counsel. Um, I really just have one thing to add to the conversation, which is. Um, a reminder that we have about most of our subcommittees are meeting about four more times before the date that our report is due. Um, so we've been obviously doing a whole lot of work up until this point, but I would just encourage uh, members of the public to tune in, um, especially these next couple of weeks, because decision points are going to be happening probably at every meeting. Um, so now is the time to uh, go onto our website and um, blog your public comment or come to the meeting, the subcommittee meetings if you can, or make a public comment at uh, the board meeting um, because things are going to start happening even more quickly over the next couple of weeks. That's all I have. I don't have anything further to add. Great. Public comment. So I think the way that we've been doing this is if you want to raise your virtual hand, we'll take the folks who have their virtual hand raised. 
uh, first, and then folks on the phone, and then folks in the room. Is that how we've been doing it? We're doing it. Uh, sure. Yeah, we've, okay. been folks in the room we've been first. doing folks in the room first, so I apologize. Um, would you like to make a public comment? Uh, sure. I so, so we can sit here just to the camera. Uh, my name is Nicholas Shorman. I'm with Vermont Normal. Um, I'm going to talk about something that I mean I got here a little late, but that it wasn't discussed while I was here. Uh, talking about caps on THC um, for flat for medical for products, both concentrates and um, for flour. So I just came back from a uh, two week long trip in California and in Oregon and in Nevada, three legal and very robust markets. And while I was there, I visited dispensaries in each of the states. And I really spoke to the people who were selling the cannabis who are at the forefront of this market. You know, not those fulfilling the orders, but really those who are talking to people at their, at the moment of decision when they're on. So how are they deciding what to buy and what is kind of the deciding factor and it always comes down to THC percentage whether or not that's a good thing for the market that is the main deciding factor um, when people buy because I mean due to COVID you're limited to the available to how much you can smell it how much you can look at the product so really the one factor that people are buying off of is that one number which is, you know you can argue is hard to compare across multiple products but that is what people are buying on so I think that's something important for the board to consider um, that these caps are very restrictive for a lot of these craft growers because it sets a it sets a ceiling for the level of um, the level of expression that is able to be you know expressed by these growers really and like to be able to separate the really good ones from the mid tier ones um, and it was fascinating to see though that that was the number one uh, factor across all boards no matter where I went no matter who I talked to it doesn't matter color what it looks like, what it tastes like, what it smells like, it always comes down to the THC percentage and the price, but mostly it's that number, 30%, whether it's 17%, 31%. Um, and I think that's something to just keep in mind that, um, and consider moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. And then I can't see who's a first. Uh, Dave Silverman is first. Dave Silverman. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, really excited by the, by the progress. Uh, being made by the especially the market structure committee um the uh the discussion on on retail tiers is uh is great stuff um and uh, really glad to hear it um a, a word of caution uh on the discussion on on medical um you know it, it, you discussed sort of james discussed three different things that i think in combination could create an unintended consequence um so if you eliminate the three month relationship and expand the qualified conditions to anything, uh, which are, are things that I support, uh, and you um, allow dispensary, uh, allow patients to buy tax free at adult use shops, you could inadvertently create a situation like what we saw early in the pandemic in Massachusetts. Uh, when Mass closed its rec shops, but kept open its medical dispensaries. And so a bunch of consumers who are adult use consumers are not really medical patients, went and got medical cards um, so that they could continue to, to buy uh, during the, the shutdown. But as a result, they now the rec, rec shops open back up. Now they're buying tax free. And I don't think that's the kind of subsidy that anybody really intends here, uh, nor do I think it, it's gonna be particularly necessary if in Vermont, what happens is the same as, happened, as has happened everywhere else where prices begin to come down um, once the regulated market uh, is fully matured. Um, so, you know, just I'm just wanting you to, keep an eye on that and the potential for you know tax revenues to be too low uh if all of those things come together um and when i say too low i mean like you know just that you're 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 unnecessarily subsidizing the purchase by some people uh versus others as to you know just whether or not they we're able to go and find somebody to write them a recommendation without a true relationship. So uh, just to keep that in mind, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Tito? 
Hello. Um, today, um, I would just like to talk about the medical program. Um, I, I believe that the most intimate and effective relationship a patient can have is with their personal caregiving grower. And uh, on the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee meetings, um, it, 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 it feels as though um, that group would like to end the relationship that uh, caregiving growers have with patients. And um, it's also my belief that uh, interpreting the law that's saying that, we, that the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee has to have three seats dedicated to caregivers, it feels as though they're trying to change the definition of caregiver just so that those three seats are not filled by, by uh, caregiving uh, growers. And so uh, I'd like to reach out to anybody listening to this right now. Uh, if you are a caregiver, um, please, please take an hour and a half out of your day on Wednesday and attend this meeting. Uh, the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee, uh, it's at 1 o'clock on Wednesday. Um, they do make it hard sometimes by not posting the agenda or links. If you have trouble finding it or getting on there, please reach out to me or uh, Jeff from Vermont Growers or Jesse Lynn, um, and we can help you get on there. And uh, please have your voice heard, and let's keep the – medical program alive because it feels like it's on the the uh the doorstep of, of being over um so that's it and uh thank you all thank you Catherine Breyers hi thank you guys um i'm a regional planner with the bennington county regional commission down in southwest vermont and um board member hulberd mentioned that there's a municipal survey out and I wasn't sure if I understood that is that going to be closing this Saturday or next Saturday it closes this Saturday oh, okay. um, and I can connect with you about who in Brattleboro has completed it okay yeah because I was just wondering sometimes when we email our member towns we can help give a boost to responses um, but but with it closing tomorrow um, that that wouldn't be that helpful but if there's a way you know if it weren't closing till next week, we could potentially try and push it out if there's a low response weight rate in Bennington County. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any other public comment? Oh, yeah. oh. Is there another? There's two phones. And it's star six to oh, it's, Yes, it's star six on mute. Um, if there's folks on the phone that want to make a public comment, it's star six to unmute. Okay. Okay. It looks like Pepper's back. Yeah, I apologize for that. I hope uh, I wasn't too jumbled. Um, but uh, I, uh, if there's no other public comment, um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, so we're back at it on Monday with subcommittees. Thank you.